Okay, this video is called Healthcare Secrets uh, to provide you with an overview of how healthcare works. So, <clears throat> first thing up here is average health. This is what the average person does, what the average person thinks. Basically, before 1900, the mainstay of medical treatments was therapeutic phlebotomy, which actually does have some benefit in certain circumstances. It can lower blood viscosity, potentially improve tissue perfusion in some settings. Uh, but, you know, it was too widely applied. Most of the so-called pharmaceuticals weren't much more than snake oil. Then after 1900, and you know, in the 1900s, that century, drugs progressively became more prominent. Um, surgery progressively improved. There were some forms of screening, like mammography in particular was the most common one that I was exposed to in total cholesterol, for example. So that's blood screening versus imaging screening. Um, in... 2000 to 2010, there's a big upsurge in the amount of implanted metal devices. Tons of pacemakers, automatic implantable cardiac defibrillators, coronary artery stents, uh, stents in other locations, lots of joint replacements, especially hips, but also knees. And nowadays, you're seeing more and more shoulder replacements. Um, after 2010, um, we see even more of this screening. And so the average person thinks, well, I've got to be proactive about my health. I better go get screened for all these things. I'll just give you a piece of advice. The smart move is not to get screened. I mean, some people, okay, yeah, some people will benefit from screening. But what I'm trying to say is the smart move is to lower your pretest probability, lower your risk. Because if you lower your risk, you probably don't even need to be screened. And screening is not without side effects. Let's say you go to get a lung cancer screening CAT scan of your chest. Well, guess what? They're going to do that probably because you smoke cigarettes or it's some exposure to some type of toxic fumes. And the smart move is don't smoke, okay? Become a low-fat, low-sodium vegan, all right? That'll drop your risk dramatically. Because when you go for one of these screening CAT scans, let's say for a lung cancer screening CAT scan, they're going to find very often some type of low-density lesion in the liver or the... Uh, kidney, for example, they're going to be benign cysts almost always. But you know, a doctor has to be careful. They're going to say, "Well, check it out with an ultrasound. Check it out with a CAT scan. Check it out with an MRI." A lot of times, the kidney cyst, for example, is going to come back mildly complex, thinly septated cyst, most likely a Bosniak too. But follow up ultrasound recommended in 10 months or something. That'd be pretty typical. So what I'm trying to say is. You can kind of get trapped in this loop, always worried, i got to go back for my follow-up screening, maybe I've got something. And I can tell you, almost always those things are nothing. If it's cancer, there's usually a big honking mass and it's pretty obvious. But just to play it safe, because there are journal articles about these very subtle lesions that sometimes turn out to be cancer, you know, there's a very, the old joke in medicine is, what's the definition of a healthy person? Somebody who hasn't had a body CT yet. And what I'm trying to say is, you get stuck with tons and tons of incidentalomas. It is expected amongst physicians in the know that if a patient goes for a body CT, there's probably going to be at least one incidentaloma. An incidentaloma means something is found that requires follow-up, but it's probably nothing. A little bump on the adrenal gland. I see those all the time, unless they're you know more than two centimeters, really, especially more than three centimeters. They're almost always nothing. Okay, so a person could very easily. Go for a screening CAT scan. There's micronodules in the lung from, you know, something problem they had when they were a kid, you know, many, many, many years ago. But we don't know. We just get one snapshot in time. Got to get a follow-up. Okay, so I tell you about that. Another common thing I think I see guys saying, oh, I got to be proactive about my prostate. I'm going to go check my PSA. And again, me personally, I would consider that stupid because what you want to do is lower your pretest probability so your risk is so low you don't screen. The reason is if you have a moderate risk, which most people have, you're much more likely to find a false positive and you can get stuck with unnecessary workups, uh, diagnostic procedures, or treatments. You don't want that. So it's also a question of your risk tolerance. I have a high risk tolerance. I know my risk is very low. I know the consequences potentially of false positives and everything that can entail, which can be a major, major, major big deal. It could ruin your life, okay? I'm fully aware of that. So I would not screen myself unless I really thought I was pretty high risk for something. And there's a lot of screening tests where you don't really take a risk. You can get your blood total cholesterol checked, 
no risk. And if you dramatically keep your blood total cholesterol low, there you are, protected from coronary artery disease, your risk of cancer, including prostate cancer, markedly decreased. Why not do that? That's a reasonable thing to do. Check your blood pressure. If it's high, you can make additional adjustments to lower your blood pressure. There's no uh, risk in doing that. But when you go to get a PSA and it comes back potentially elevated, now they're starting to talk prostate biopsy. It can be very painful. Uh, you might have one of these people who's got one of these low-grade prostate cancers that you never would have known your whole life. But now because you've heard the cancer word, you're scared and you get... Um, you know, a biopsy and then it comes back positive, low grade, what do you do? A lot of patients are just really scared so they go for surgery when, you know, maybe they didn't need to do anything. Take a look at the Orner study uh, where he put the patients on vegetarian diet and they held their PSAs down um, with low grade prostate cancer, his group of watchful waiting patients. All right, so anyways, I just gave you a little clue about screening. It's a bigger deal than you realize. So Blood tests, pretty safe, usually not a follow-up consequence. Imaging stuff, except for PSA, is a little bit dangerous. Okay, EBM. EBM is evidence-based medicine. And what this really means is, is usually just advertising. So what happened is a lot of the big companies, they would see that their uh, the reputation for their product, their drug, or whatever it was, was going down. So they would, they're so rich, they just buy a journal, and then they pay scientists to publish positive articles about their product, whatever it is, a device, implantation, or a, a pharmaceutical. And then they can say, well, look, the majority of studies show a benefit from our pharmaceutical, our device, our whatever it is being sold. So, you know, the average ignorant person goes, oh, well, gee, three out of four studies said it's good. It must be good. No, not necessarily. A negative study is usually much more predictive than a positive study. And you really got to know who's funding the paper. You know, what's the angle of the person's writing the paper? And you can get it. You could kind of figure that out, too, if you just look and see if they've got several other publications and they're all promoting that item. And you can kind of tell a lot of times from how a study is set up. Um... Okay, genetic medicine, what's that all about? Well, you know, a drug company is going to love to call something genetic because that means there's nothing you could do about it in general. But I can tell you hardly anything is genetic. There are genetic vulnerabilities, but it's rare that something is a purely genetic genetic. So you might have a slightly genetically higher total cholesterol, but if you go low-fat vegan, you'll probably get it under control anyway. So it's pretty much of a non-issue. I would watch out for somebody telling you something is primarily genetic. That's a very overrated thing. People, I've seen tons of sick people who just say, it's my genes. Everybody in my family's fat. Everybody in my family has diabetes. Everybody in my family had open heart surgery for coronary artery disease. Well, P.S. When people go low-fat vegan, virtually no one ever needs coronary artery disease, uh, coronary artery surgery, you know, cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Okay, precision medicine is another way to kind of bring the person in, do a whole bunch of diagnostic tests on them, and then give them a bunch of specialized supplements or something and make money off them. There's no money off telling people, look, eat the low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet. Again, I provide this YouTube channel, you know, to at least the, the more intellectually curious, smarter people will have some path to find something that empowers them. And so, and, you know, some things really have improved in medicine. For example, I used to do, I do tons of biopsies. I've done over a thousand biopsies. And I used to have to very often use these big needles, 18 gauge, for example, because pathology needed these big specimens. Nowadays, I can get most things with tiny little needles, 25 gauge, because uh, pathology slides have gotten a lot better. You can follow uh, blood glucose levels a lot easier with continuous glucose monitors. Um, ultrasound guided procedures have replaced a lot of the more open procedures. A lot of things that I used to have to do with a CAT scan guidance can now be done with ultrasound guidance. For example, a lot of abscess drainage, fluid collection drainages. Um, uh, CAT scans are much better. I used to do all these catheter angiograms of the brain. Uh, nowadays, I did hundreds of them. Nowadays, and I used to do them in every acute stroke patient, the stroke neurologist would send them to me. Nowadays, the CT angiogram can provide the same information almost as good, adequate, you know, it's surprisingly good. MRI has improved a lot. Endoscopy procedures, you know, going down this way, up this way, and, you know, doing biopsies of it, all that stuff's improved. So a lot of things really have improved in medicine. In general, things that are computer-related, tech-related tend to improve. Uh, a lot of the other stuff has not really improved. The, the center of the paradigm is still drugs and surgery, especially drugs. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's appropriate, but a lot of times, People get hung on this idea of standard of care when they're not even aware there's something actually better than that called optimal care. Standard of care is 
has to be something that you can standardize, you know, and that includes for intoxicated people, um, unconscious people, demented people, whereas an individual who's able to participate in their care, there's, you know, sometimes standard care, optimal care are the same thing, but a lot of times optimal care is much better. Okay, so what was kind of one of the, the health secret points of this whole thing? Watch out for this concept of evidence-based medicine. Mostly it's BS advertising. Watch out for screening. If you really, 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 really think you benefit, maybe it's okay, but a lot of people go into it ignorantly and they end up with false positives and expensive, unnecessary, painful workups. Okay, precision medicine, genetic medicine, sounds like more like, you know, scams to sell stuff is from what I've seen. You know, maybe something new will come out in those areas and I'll be surprised. Maybe I'll be surprised. Maybe I'll learn something, but I'm, I'm not too enthusiastic about it at this moment. Okay, and so then what's the thing that you're probably never going to hear except for a few places on the web? Who's the healthiest people in the world? It's the old-fashioned stuff. We talked plenty of times about this diet, low-fat, low-sodium, whole food, vegan, organic, have filtered water. Exercise is very good for you. Religion is very good for you. Religion people are uh, much healthier. It's very popular nowadays to act like you're too cool for religion. Secularism is very pos popular. But, you know, ask yourself, what does secularism lead to? What is secularism, what kind of a place is a secularist place? It's a place where <laughs> you don't have a lot of freedom, okay? Um, you know, there's nothing like the family. Aristotle, plenty of other people have said, is the family, you know, designed by God to address man's wants, all right? Uh, so even though some of your family members might be annoying, try to get along with at least some of them. People who have at least one good friend are a lot healthier. Um, friends can be a wonderful thing. Love can be a wonderful thing when you've got the opportunity for it in your life. Get your sunshine. You know, getting that vitamin D3 uh, a reasonable amount. It doesn't have to be high. And the, B, the, you know, the vitamin D2 levels are exaggerated, what you need. McDougal's got good lectures on that. Have some type of good purpose in your life where you're helping other people, you're doing something positive or creative or useful because that generates inner resilience in a person. It gets the positive life-enriching hormones to be increased and it helps to minimize the negative ones. Basically, persons who have at least one strong purpose in life, they're just more resilient. And religion does a lot of that, answers the metaphysical questions that make you enthusiastic about getting up in the morning, seeing your life as having meaning. So... Uh, that was kind of the whole point of this, that this old-fashioned stuff that's not very glamorous, there's no money in it, doesn't get any press or promotion hardly, but it works better for most things and all this other stuff put together.